he was mentioning about, he, he, uh, Joey was talking earlier about inclusive policies and what we can do. Along with inclusive policies, we need also those um, key stakeholders and those persons within the various ministries to be able to, um, you know, carry out those um, um, policies, inclusive policies, so that others can definitely be following and, 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 and enacting those um, policies. And I think that that's a twofold problem that we actually have in the Bahamas, that the enforcement of policies that we have on, 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 on our law books is a big issue, as well as the kinds of policies. So after you've already fixed the, um, the policies, ensure that, ensuring that they are followed um, and complied with, not just by the members of the public, but also the people who are enforcing them, because that's a big issue. And we've known for a very long time that in particular, when it comes to LGBTQ people, there's a serious issue that we have with police, right? The Royal Bahamas Police Force and the way that they police the community. And so um, Aaron and I, um, uh, we've reached out to, um, we've attempted to kind of um, get some police um, personnel here. Um, it was a bit difficult. Um, and a lot of them, the way that the, the, way that the bureaucratic structure is set up um, and dealing with COVID-19, we all know that they are a bit stretched thin and so there wasn't that much, um, there, there wasn't much, uh, I guess, initiative to kind of come and have this kind of conversation. So we decided that we would talk about um, this kind of um, conversation in this way. And then hopefully next year, when we, when we address this again, we'll have, actually have police presence that can speak to and so that we can address our concerns. So similar to what we, uh, what we were doing um, earlier, um, that's the kind of vein we want to take it in. Um, but right now, um, I'll welcome Erin. Um, and I think that she's going to set the tone. I, wanted to, I, I want Erin to tell us about um, some of the experiences that she's had personally. Because I've been, I've, been, um, I've been very instrumental or I've been adamant about talking about that we need to have the stories told. Alexis has been talking about this too. We need the stories to be told, but also when the stories are being told, we need faces to those stories simply because sometimes people don't believe or they don't, they can't connect with stories because of, uh, because they, they're not connected to the people. And so in our attempt to, to kind of um, contextualize and give uh, the landscape, I want Erin to talk about um, certain incidences that she's had and, and, and she's actually followed a, a like the process, she's gone up the chain of command and there has been like no recourse. And so she's gonna talk, tell us about a few stories and then that'll get us situated for the conversation, okay? So Erin, are you there? Good morning, good morning. Good morning <laughs> this morning. Morning everyone. So I'm Erin Green, uh, intersectional uh, human rights advocate. I've been working in advocacy from the year 2000, started with uh, CAFRA, Caribbean Association for Research and Action, and then locally, um, as a part of a local body, Rainbow Alliance of the Bahamas. Um, years into my advocacy, um, at one point, when, after RAB was disbanded in 2008, somebody began stalking me via telephone. And every day I would get these calls. Um, it would be somebody breathing heavily or not saying anything, um, refusing to hang up the phone, right? They'd stay on the phone as long as we would keep the phone up. And I went to BTC to just make sure that we weren't having a technical issue with the phone, right? And they said, everything is fine, there's, there's nothing, nothing on this end. So after um, a month of this happening, it happening, I'd say maybe four times a week, I, I started keeping a call log, right? And after a month of the call log, I took it to my nearest police station, which is Fox Hill Police Station, made a report. And they said, you know, we're gonna look into it. I know Fox Hill Police Station is small and I know the police are generally overwhelmed. So I gave it some time and I came back in a month. When I came to check on the officers at Fox Hill Station were, were surprised that I was coming in to, to, to inquire about this investigation. There was no call log, there was no file, there was no record of me making a complaint. So I made the complaint again. I began to keep a, a call log. And after about a month, I took it back in. 
to be attached to the, to the request for an investigation. And after a month, I went in. Uh, I gave it a little more time and I went in. And again, nobody had any record of a file, no call log, no record of an investigation being started, nothing, right? So I got really frustrated. And, and then, but then I said to myself, Look, if this is a small fry officer in a small fry station like Fox Hill, I will err on the side of caution. And I presume that maybe they didn't want to touch it, right? Maybe this have to do with somebody in a position of authority, uh, maybe in the phone company, maybe in government, and they didn't want to touch it. So I said I can create a third. I created a third log, call log, and took it in and 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 made a complaint and opened up a new case, right? And after a month, I went in and it was the same thing, three times in a row. We have no record of a file. We have no record of you coming in and making a complaint and we don't have a call log. So I then went to, I tried to go, I think through CDU, but I paused because I was, at this point I was very concerned. Why would the police not even have, even if you lose the call log, the evidence, why wouldn't you have an, an indication of the report? So I said, you know what? I'm going to attempt to make an appointment with the prime minister, who was Hubert Ingram at the time. And I spent six months waiting for the six months into the leading, you know, going into the election, waiting for the prime minister's office to respond with an appointment, call back, call back. Oh, we, we no appointment yet, no appointment yet. It wasn't until the, admin, the administration changed, the PLP came into government. I made, an, I called in and asked to speak to the prime minister's secretary, because I know the prime minister, not very well, but he grew up in the, in the same area as my mother. He knows my mother. And when he got that message, he, he had his people call me and I came in almost immediately for an appointment, right? With, with, with Christy. And when I sat down in his office and explained to him what was happening, he said to me, Go, when you leave here, go directly to the commissioner of police's office. Mm -hmm. I will call him and indicate to him that you are coming and he'll be waiting for you. And I believe you me, when I got there, the commissioner of police was waiting for a meeting with me. I explained to the commissioner of police what happened. And he told me they are going to deal with it. This is unacceptable. And then nothing, nothing. And then after and this, so this all went on over a period of about three years. And after waiting for months and months for a response from the commissioner of police, two officers showed up at my house one day, an, an inspector in khaki and an officer in, blue, in blues, right? And asked to speak to my mother and I because the phone is in her name. And they sat us down and this is what they told me. But Telco has determined that the threat does not warrant further investigation. That's what they told me. But Telco has determined that the threat does not warrant further investigation. At no point in time did Batelco indicate to us that it was a fault in the phone system. But further to that, we even documented calls where somebody spoke. And one day my mother answered the phone because, I'd, I'd, you know, after about six months of that, she stopped answering the phone. One day my mother answered the phone because I wasn't home and the person started talking to her and telling her about her daughter. Right? And so even with my mother indicating that she spoke to somebody and heard somebody's voice, so it couldn't be a fault in the telephone line, that's the line that they gave us. I wanted to push the issue further. Right? I wanted to see if more calls would come in and I could continue to document them and take it up higher. But my mother it was so frustrated and concerned that she just changed the telephone number. Right? Um, and, and up to this day, there's been no recourse, there's been no response from the, uh, there's been no response from Telco about whether there was a technical fault, um, nothing. And so for the last, you know, almost 10 years, I've been working as an advocate and doing this work, knowing that there was somebody out there who was stalking me, that if they've been identified, they haven't been identified by me, and they may still be out there. 
and you know, just quickly, the impact of, on, of that on my work was that I became sort of a silo because I had no idea where that particular thread was coming from. And I had already, particularly when I began the advocacy, received threats from people outside of the community and inside of the community. So I didn't know where the thread was coming from and I created a, a sort of an advocacy space that was a silo because I didn't know who to trust. And that has greatly impacted the direction of my advocacy, right? Um, I try to, you know, I'm open to working with people all the time, but I have to be very careful about it. Um, so that, you know, that, that's that. There's just been no recourse on that matter. The second incident that happened, um, when RAB started, we had three public spokespeople. And one was Helen Clonaris, one was myself, and one was a gentleman by the name of Mindell Small. Mindell Small subsequently left, the, he left the country um, partially due to threats and due to people trying to coerce him to leave advocacy, a whole bunch of stuff. Anyway, one day in the Tribune, here's a story from Mindell Small who has relocated, you know, I think to Canada and had found found a partner and he had an article in the paper, like an interview, and he was basically saying, I, I wouldn't come back to the Bahamas because I can't get married and my marriage won't be um, recognized. And, and, and so it was a, a statement. Now, I went, I work in fruit and vegetables, right? I source and sell fruit and vegetables, so I'm on potter's key a lot. And at that time, I had started cutting my hair bald all the time, right? I was on potter's key one day. I was leaving potter's key and I was in a long, long line of traffic. And all of a sudden, this man who was about two cars back from me started riling up about the homosexuals and the sissies and their agenda and look what they're trying to do. And he was trying to draw a crowd, you know? So what I did was, because we were sort of stuck in this space, I told my partner to, to put the car in park. And I came out the back and I had a cutlass and a pipe in the car. And I pulled them out the car. know some people on the dock but I figured that would shut it down and then I went to Porter's Key Station to report it and the police at Porter's Key Station they like they basically ignored me right so we got off the dock and I went to CDU to report it and I spoke to who the, the head of CDU at the time was Paul Roll and this is I'm saying this is a public record now, but what he indicated to me was, look, we, I take these matters seriously, even if other officers don't, and please report the, you know, anything that happens to me, if anything happens. But the officers at Portis Key acted like, well, what you doing on the dock if you're a homosexual? And why are you balling your head? Like, that's how they acted. Why are you balling your head if you don't want people to think you gay? Um, and that also greatly impacted my work, right? Because then I had to, I had to limit the time that I spent on Potter's Key. And I mean, it, it, it greatly impacted, at that time, it greatly impacted my ability to source and sell vegetables. Um, and those two particular instances, I, with the second instance, what I wanted to point out was that even though individual officers or even senior officers may be aware of what their obligation is, to members of the LGBT community, it appears as if they don't have the will or the ability to ensure that all officers understand their obligation or, or the will or ability to entrench policy and enforce policy and ensure that it's carried out despite how they may personally feel, which is still an indictment on them to some extent because they are in a position of authority. Definitely, um, definitely. Um, while we're here, um, would you would you and Alexis can elaborate on the story that you guys were sharing with me um, about the raid um, that was happening? I think um, with I guess of, of the, the the U.S. agency or the U.S. Um, um, I think y'all were having. Uh, so, uh, yeah. it's a, it was a. Um, Alexis can tell you more about the event. What I know is that it is a cruise a queer cruise, an Afro queer cruise that had a history of coming to the Bahamas. It was in their first trip built a relationship. 
advocates with the DeMarco and other advocates on the ground. And this is a, I mean, this is a part of the tourism product, right? Established experience. And so I, from my perspective, and then I'll let Alexis give you all the meat of it. Um, I was invited to come check out the show. And I came to check out the show and the space was cool and everybody was having a good time. And uh, then all of us, this performer came on stage and she was performing. And then all of a sudden, root up the place. And what I remember in particular is that, well, two things. A number of officers recognized who I was and they were acting in a way that suggested that they knew who I was and they weren't going to engage me at all because they didn't want to say anything that would get me involved, right? Like that would get me personally involved, wanting to sue or deal with a personal engagement. And a couple of officers called my name and all, even though they were in, in riot gear. But for what was what was interesting is this, is that when that performer came on, right? And she was performing, they had spies in there. They were prepared, right? They were in there waiting for an opportunity to come in. And the moment seized upon her was the incorrect moment because they assumed that the performer was naked. When in fact, the performer had on a nude silhouette, like a silhouette, like a nude outfit. So they weren't naked at all. And anybody close up could see that they were not naked. That was obvious. But they had, they had people in there waiting for something to happen that they could seize to justify coming in to, to, to conduct a raid. And, they, and it was like a Gestapo move. And another thing that got me was the fear and concern, the fear of the performer who was detained and the other performers and the concern and the fear of the organizers, right? Because this is, I mean, for me, this was unprecedented. They came in there, Gestapo, they, and, and then here's the other thing. They also had immigration officers, right? They had a team of immigration officers. And here's what happened. I don't know if you remember, DeMarco, I just remembered what happened immediately prior. Somebody got a hold, somebody got wind of the event and it was a religious figure and they, they worked their fax machine to death. And they sent out a press statement to anybody they could get it to. They sent it out to every church. They sent it out to every police unit. And the message that went with it, it was intellectually dishonest. It was dishonest. It wasn't true. They tried to the, the gays, the sissies are coming to take over Bay Street and we need to go out there and protest. So this was a, the, the, the raid was a part of a concerted effort. Now, mind you, the police may not have been involved in a conspiracy to falsely detain, right, people, but somebody, somebody intended to have that event shut down. They tried to do their legwork by getting the religious community and all the civil society organizations involved. And then it or they're waiting for something to seize upon. Now, post the event, I, one thing I'll say, the Marco those and the, the organizers of the event, they were prepared. And they had people, well, they had people to reach out to at the very least uh, because they acted quickly. They took responsibility for their, you know, for their, cli their, their employees and their clients, for, the, for their subcontractors. The Marco those to make sure that the people were not feel that they were not detained any longer than absolutely necessary. But for me, it was one of the experience of that. And it was, it was horrifying. And I could imagine for in a safe space to have that happen, it was traumatizing, absolutely traumatizing. Okay, um, Alexis, do you want to jump in, um, and I guess give your, um, I guess your perspective, and add um, a little bit more to that. So because, and 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 we're doing this so that we can contextualize the way that policing strategies have always occurred within the Bahamas towards LGBTQ people. 
because most LGBTQ people do not feel safe walking into a police station and saying to them, I've been assaulted by my partner, I've, something has happened to me, I need help. And so this is why we're doing this exercise right now. So I just wanna give you a few stories so that we can contextualize it um, as we seek to dive into the policing strategies, the structure, and then um, give maybe some solutions um, as to how policing efforts can, um, can occur with inclusive policies and inclusive strategies. Go ahead, Alexis. Well, <laughs> that's just one of the many incidents that has taken place in our country. And that's just to our guests and our tourists. The people that visit our islands for four days, five days, a day, a week. That incident took place in October, um, October 6th. And what happened was that we had a relationship with this LGBTI group that normally bring tourists to our, normally come as tourists to our country to enjoy our sun, our sand, our sea, and to interact with local Bahamians. And at this particular event, what happened was the police raided that place. And it was so disheartening to see how our guest was treated by police officers. You know, for me as a young advocate back then, it gave me insight as to why I have to do this work and why it's important to be visible. Had no LGBTI advocate or activist was in that place, we wouldn't have known how those persons would have been treated. But because of our visibility in that space and demanding those officers and saying, no, no, you can't do that. You can't treat them like that. It made them shift on the way they were handling those tours, especially the entertainer herself. I remember the guy rushing to cover her so the police officers wouldn't be filming her. And they was like, no, you can't film her like that. You yes, understand? yes. Although she had on the new, he covered her to ensure that she, um, they, was, they was filming her, like to make a spectacle of the individual. So for us, it was important. Our visibility was important within that particular space with the police. And to talk about just this one incident, for many years, the Bahamas back then, the Bahamas LGBTI community was facing abuse from police officers. They would come into our spaces and our clubs and they would line everybody up against the wall, taking their pictures one by one by one in our own space, our own clubbing safe space where we were free to be ourselves. We were targeted by police officers. And there were particular police officers within the force who would say, oh, they're having this party or they're having this, shut them down. Slap them up, do whatever you do, put them in the big bus. I remember my um, dry queens, I remember dry queens, pictures being taken and put into buses for nothing because they're in a space. They're in a club that was designate, designated to them to be free and lined up against the wall and put into um, um, buses and made spectacles and pictures on the next page of the punch. And I forget what's the name of the other um, news The confidential that source. Yes, the confidential source, you know? So this, 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 this thing of bridging the gap between the police and my community is very dear to my heart. I have a personal person who, 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 who engaged with the police force, who understands the tactics of the police force, where he himself was targeted at that club and slapped and was told, oh, you're going to see this next one the next time um, to the, um, oh, you see, use this, use that aid. His, between his own squad mates, suffering violence at the hand of his own squaddies. That's what they call them or whatever, mm -hmm. you know? It was very traumatizing. And to this day, he still talks about that incident. So for me, this is personal. Yes, the political has become personal because there are too many Bahamians who are afraid to report incidents of violence, not because of the perpetrator, you know, but because of the way they've been treated by the police. When you walk into a police station as an LGBTI citizen of this country, in times past, you were a spectacle. You were made fun of. God forbid you're a trans person. Everybody's coming to see who you are. In times past, 
incidents of police officers telling and even present to a report I just read from someone who claimed asylum, even present when a same-sex couple made a report to the police officer about violence. The statement that was made, if y'all wasn't like this, this wasn't going to happen to you. Like what? I remember a personal incident dealing with my own LGBTI family, reporting an incident of violence, domestic same relation violence with his intimate partner, violence with his partner, walking into a police station to make the report, to have a restraining order against the individual. The police said out of his mouth, you know y'all don't have no rights, right? I said, what? That was said to the individual, you know they don't have no rights, right? Not knowing who I was or not knowing my law, not knowing um, advocacy. I said, no, 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 no. What you mean they don't have no rights? They are Bahamian citizens and they're reporting an incident of violence. Thank God there was an ally officer who is a part of the LGBTI community who was able to take the complaint and take the report. So I think for us moving forward is working with our officers in the, that's like a whole secret society, so I've heard. So it's, it's very yeah. difficult to, to, to talk about things. And I mean, they need to create a welcoming space. Because well, now me, we do have LGBTI officers. DeMarco, let me, let me add here. Um, growing up in the, with the punch, right? Reading the punch regularly, uh, especially use, you know, documenting stories in the media, seeing the punch talk about the fairy godmother at the force, right? Seeing the in, some of the internal tensions and allegations and, and stigma coming up through there made me realize that, look, like you say, a, it's a, it's a, there's a secret, it's a club, and then there are secret clubs in the clubs, and then there are groups that are forced to invisibilize themselves in those spaces. Um, and, and I think that'll, you know, that'll lead into a part of the discussion about this, what strategies do we take, you know? Um, yes. But it, 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 it's so difficult then, and then you want to protect officers that you know are queer, and maybe suffering in those spaces. You don't, you don't want to call on them for your issue because you know that may bring more violence and discrimination to them because they're trying to stick up for their community members, you know? Um, and one thing I remember as an advocate is people wouldn't tell me where entertainment party spaces were, where parties were. And somebody told me, we don't want you to come because you're visible, right? Like if people see you in this area, they'll know something is going on, right? And so I took it upon myself to sort of invisibilize myself in those spaces, right? Because if, if my visibility increases the risk of violence drawn to the community, then I'm gonna pull back, right? I'm gonna pull back and let people have their safe spaces. All right. Um, while we're here at this moment, I want to bring Dr. Saunders in because I see her hand is up. She, it's been up for a while. Um, Dr. Saunders, you, would you like to say something um, concerning this? Your mic is mute, Dr. Saunders. Oh, yeah, I was saying that there, uh, there has been a long history of violence uh, against LGBT going all the way back from the early days of visibility. I would say as soon as you had the emergence of gay clubs, um, the harassment began. Um, before that, there, you didn't have it. It's kind of interesting, the no-name clubs. I've been to some of the no-name clubs prior to clubs that were openly gay, and they ignored them. In fact, there was one opposite the police station on East Street. 
they never, that wasn't, they didn't harass. Um, but visibility seemed to have exasperated the problem immensely. Um, and so I think one has to see this harassment and, and the rise of that in terms of openly gay club scenes and social venues. That's when the harassment uh, increased dramatically. Before that, I'm not saying there was none, but it was not on this on the level that it was. So there's been an intensification of harassment of gay people and gay patrons in openly gay venues. And that may even have contributed to why, to the decline of the club scene, the specifically gay club scene, even a place like the Daily Grind, which is not, which is LGBT friendly, it is not identified as a, as a gay club. Still, they have been harassed. I've been there once, in fact, I wrote on it, where the police came in. I, I mean, that was, you know, several years ago, but not so long ago. This is still happening. This is still a major problem. In fact, I tried to contact, I think, an assistant commissioner at the police. I can't remember what his name was at the time. They put me in touch with him to try to see if we can have some kind of alliance to build trust, to facilitate um, a fair and non-homophobic interactions. But they wouldn't even entertain, they, the police wouldn't call me, he wouldn't call me back. I mean, he wouldn't get in touch with me. I've sent emails, calls, blah, blah. Um, and so I think a concerted effort needs to be made, but it is very difficult. They have to be open enough to take it seriously and welcome it unless the police force is willing to welcome um, uh, an alliance with the community, uh, um, and, and some type of group that is going to mediate in some way. Uh, I think it's going to be very hard to change the culture. And, and, and it's so important. It is so critical because overall, it's not just, we have a policing culture that is very harsh, that doesn't take rights in general seriously. Uh, and given a community like ours that is especially vulnerable, um, it's very difficult for us, if we're known or if we have any incident that appears to be in any way connected with same-sex socializing or uh, domestic relations, it's, it's very hard to get them to take it seriously and to be empathetic. Uh, so, I really think that the LGBT community has to make demands. Um, and I mean, whether that means writing campaigns, whether that means newspaper talks, whatever, they're not going to change easily. That, that's my feeling. It, it, it's, it's so entrenched with, within Bahamian culture uh, to ignore rights of the individual who are in the custody of police and they feel that they have a right to um, be violent, it's going to be very, very difficult. And, and women in particular, I would say harassment, there have been women 
who've been threatened with, with corrective rape, um, harassed, uh, lesbian and bi women have special vulnerabilities and by police. Hmm? Uh, not just others out there. Uh, not uncommon, but there's a lot of silence around it. Women don't want to talk about incidences. Um, so there's a lot of insecurity and vulnerability and the policing is a part of the problem. And we need to see if we can make them a part of the solution to uh, um, for tolerance and acceptance, which is an enormous task, but necessary, absolutely necessary. Okay, I think that this is a great place right here, um, as you bring up all of that, Dr. Sanders. Um, and I just want to remind all of the, um, the people in, um, or the persons in the room, if you want to share your stories and your encounters with police, then you could just raise your hand and you can have the floor. Um, uh, I want to say something. Okay, go ahead. Um, I'm putting inside of the chat, if you would like, the references and the actual sources to the incidents that's been documented, especially with the raid. And also you see, I just placed in the chat, the official, um, from August 29, 2019, we've been writing prior to that, the commission of police requesting an audience following the protocol, calling them, they say, okay, you have to write the commissioner. And from there you will get the audience. I mean, we've been, the commissioner has now changed. And upper to last week, I had a conversation from somebody who says, write the new commissioner and see if you can get an audience with them to talk about these issues. So we're going to go ahead again and we're going to write the new commissioner to see if we can get an audience to be able to speak to the issues that our community faces. Because in the reports, when you see the um, basis of claim for most persons that will claim asylum in a country, the first two lines normally talk about the police not taking them seriously as LGBTI citizens. So for example, Aaron's situation of when you go to make a police report, the report can't be found. Where, where, did, where, where, where that happens? When you claim that you have been attacked physically through violence, not even physical, just violence period, you're not taken seriously. Or Alexis, when incidents occur outside the police station, like the incident in outside the Fort Charlotte in front the of you yes. by the Daily Grind and they, and people threw rocks at the boys, yeah. right? And I mean that that interchange and the police are right there and they refuse to acknowledge that something happened. Correct, correct. Even down to the situation of um, one of our own guests being attacked at Carnival and the rigmarole and the threats that person received mm -hmm. not to report that incident. You know, it, 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 it is mind boggling to know as a citizen of this country, especially when it goes down to the unsolved murders of LGBTI citizens, maybe not visible to the public, but in our own community where there's still no justice, cases that are cold turkey. Mm -hmm. There's no justice. There's no access to it for LGBTI citizens. And this is how the community feels. That is why we have this massive influx of people leaving this country because they're not taken seriously as citizens. And the LGBTI community have been left behind when it comes to the policing and like they say, no, we, 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 we are inclusive of our policy for all Bahamians. We don't, there's no special um, policing for LGBTI people. Or, but you have to create within this force a team that is sensitized in dealing with vulnerable Absolutely. communities. Yes. For example, okay. when a parent beats a child because he or she or they identifies as an LGBTI person, or you find out something, or you catch them doing something, or however it happens, 
Or they're, you or the, or they're behaving. Them. Or they're behaving yeah. in a manner that is Or they're behaving or displaying mannerisms that are effeminate or masculine or tomboyish. And you beat that child. And that child picks up that phone. Or that family member picks up that phone and reports that parent or reports that guardian. And it's not taken seriously. When children or young adults teeth are being beaten out of their mouth and their genitalia being a being cut because they display something that you don't understand as a parent. And when it's reported to the police, oh, that's the parent. We can't get in that. Yeah. It's a serious like, situation. You know, if and I that has to do with enforcement. The laws are there, but if the police are extremely homophobic and are not sensitized, then those are cases that they should not be involved in. I mean, overall, there should be sensitization for everyone, but I'm there should serious. be a team that deals specifically, specifically. that are right. um, trained specifically. That would be a good way of mediating that process. But like you, I've also tried to, the last commissioner tried to contact him. The same issue you had, I had. It, it's like, we don't want to have a conversation with you. No. We're refusing to do this. And I think unless we put them on blast, unless um, we find a way to push them, to have this and conversation, they're going to continue to do this. We've got to figure out how to best to intervene. Who can yes. facilitate this process? Because well, absolutely. otherwise, if I, mm -hmm. otherwise it'll otherwise if I can, it'll continue. So I, yeah. I just want to before we move into some potential strategies, um, I want to I want to share this thing. We have a. You know, this is the space in which um, heterosexism and sexism um, and policing of bodies where it all intersects, right? Because they don't just have a problem with gay people, right? Oh, the know. problem with gay people is massive. I've been on a scene where we went to assist a family, my partner's cousin moving out. Her husband put her out, right? She was pregnant for him. He put her out and or he was leaving what some of them leave someone was leaving the police were on the scene the husband punched her punched a pregnant woman in front of the police and in front of us witnesses and the police did nothing another incident um that's sort of off record but i can share is that a, a young uh a young girl who was detained by the police in the car the police turned around and punched her in the mouth in the car then I had a video that I just sent to the media where a young lady was being detained and walked into Wolf Road Station and the police officer is slapping in the back of her head and talking to her about it, right on camera. And they really believe that they have the right to police bodies in this way. Absolutely. You know, but it... This, 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 this culture has been around for generations. It's not new. But no, there's okay. been a response, like you noted, Dr. Saunders, there's been a, a, a response to the visibility as if we're challenging them just by being visible, right? Yeah. And so if, Natino, if I could lead into the, the just ahead. the three quick um, strategies. So I want to offer three um, experiences that I had that lead to potential strategies, right? I, um, the first is a regional strategy or a, a strategy that comes out of the region. Kanita Placide, who presented on the uh, regional advocacy panel, who is the uh, chair of EK, the uh, Eastern Caribbean Association for Diversity and I think Equality. She uh, has facilitated along with Maurice Tomlinson, who is a Jamaican Canadian uh, queer man and LGBTI advocate, a police sensitivity training that's run um, and, and, and facilitated by his partner that is a member of the Canadian Army, right? And, and one of the things that they found is that from the feedback from several sessions in the region is the police indicated that they felt very comfortable getting this training from another person in uniform. 
another person in the military. So the training is something that's available to us and it, it speaks to you know, some of the avenues we would explore about getting police involved in the training, right? The second, um, the two things, I did the IVL, uh, International Visitors Leadership Program, and they took us through the United States on this tour. And two stops we made. The first was in Washington, D.C., at the Washington, D.C. Metro Police LGBT unit. And what they did in D.C. was they created a police unit specifically to deal with LGBTI issues. So I imagine that they, um, they assessed officers before they allowed them to join the unit or asked them to join the unit to make sure that they were comfortable, they weren't homophobic, they understood what they were doing, and they, would, they were able to, do, to, to, to deal with a lot of issues that weren't being dealt with before, in particular, domestic violence and domestic violence within the community, right? And they were able to provide better solutions for engagement with members of the trans community, with uh, people who engage in sex work. Um, and that, so that's an avenue that we can explore. Uh, the third avenue is this. We, we made a stop to Des Moines police unit, police station. And one of the things that they shared, which was really interesting was this. They were very familiar with uh, Ellingston Greenslade, former commissioner of police. Uh, and, and at the time he was the chief of police and a member of the International Association of Chiefs of Police. And they recommended to us that we start at the top. Two things, that that's where their, that, that's where their sort of mandate started, from the very top, from sessions with chiefs of police and sending that mandate down. The second very interesting thing was that they thought that Ellingston Greenslade would be a great person. Like they thought that this boy would, he understands, he knows what, we, what you're talking about and he would be a great person to do this work. And I wonder, you know, then what happened? Where was the gap? And I, it makes me also wonder why did he so quickly become an ambassador? Is it because he was ready to come in there and challenge? These structures, you know, these structures of violence to challenge the issues and to and to make a big change, and you know, is that why they moved him on? But you know, and so I just throw that out there. So the three, uh, the three things are this: a regional, uh, a regionally um, constructed police sensitivity training, right, where we attempt to engage officers from across the force, right? Officers, it'll be in, in stations and units across the force. So that sensitivity is present in every unit or space. Do we want to, like the DC route, which was lobby and advocate for the create and support the creation of a specific LGBTI unit, or do we want to engage as a specific campaign, the International Association of Chiefs of Police and see if our, our force is prepared, right? Like to engage the programming that they have and then, and then inculcate that in the Royal Bahamas Police Force. And then I think that, you know, I let you speak about um, where we would sit in any of those dynamics, right? As a community, but then also as an advocacy grouping, right? Like what would be the role of LGBTI advocates in any of these um, um, platforms. All right, um, Dr. Kramer, um, you can go ahead and then I'll get to that, that part. Okay, I mean, I, I contacted Greenslade and I didn't get any response. Now, I don't know if he matured, but mm, before he left to be ambassador, I did. Um, mm -hmm. I agree with the sensitivity training. If we can get regional connections or regional um, experiences to facilitate that, that would be good. I do think we need a civic board composed of LGBT to mediate. I think that's absolutely crucial uh, because our problem is that I'm sure that your police commissioners and assistant commissioners, they're aware of police sensitivity training 
around gender, around LGBT issues. The problem is a political one. Hmm? That is what it is. And that is the challenge that we face. How do we um, lobby, whether it's politicians, whether it's uh, commissioners, how we have to construct a civic group and we have to lobby with all um, LGB affirmative individuals and those who are concerned with gender uh, uh, and human rights more generally, um, where policing is humane, where policing operates how it should operate. We, we need advocacy. And this is something that I do think that we can, can, if possible, which is not easy to do because of differences, um, find a way to work around these issues of changing policing more generally and more specifically to address the needs of LGBT and, and uh, can I add, can I add, Dr. Saunders, I think, you know, what you're saying is so important and it's a priority because in this small island developing state, if we as a community do not develop the, the tools and mechanisms and strategies to provide a degree of security within the community, guess what? The police is our next savior, right? Like, because as citizens, we're supposed to rely on them to protect us, right? And like one of the things in, in my advocacy, I was very careful to moderate my public engagement because I knew that if I quote unquote caused a riot, who the hell am I gonna rely on to protect gay people? But the police, right? Um, and so we have to figure out how to get these by them to do what they supposed to do. Because as we become more visible, as we advocate more, as we agitate more, we're gonna be dealing with an increased hostility and backlash from certain segments of the community. Yep, absolutely. I, has, 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 and, 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 and I've intentionally let all of you talk because one of the things, because uh, Aaron was talking about where we sit. So when Alexis contacted me and Ida in particular, to, and she brought us on, on for this um, cause of pride. She also um, kind of gave us some leeway with another um, um, kind of brainchild that she had, um, you know, came up with, which was the Bahamas Organization of LGBTI Affairs. And we were, we, we've been instrumental, me and Ida in particular have been instrumental in drafting what that constitution of this particular organization would look like. And in it, the way that we were, we've constructed it, we've, we're almost done with the constitution, just so or the um, just so that the the organization can run. But we've been, we've intentionally put um, committees where the committees would address each needs of of, of 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 people who identify as gay, lesbian, transgender, so that those committees can then specifically bring programs to each of these particular um, um, sexual orientation or genders and have them come from members of those communities who understand their plight. But one of the things that I think Dr. Kareem Sanders talks about is, and I've been like, that's the kind of tip that I've been on is, I'm done talking. You're, they will continue to avoid and I'm not letting you avoid. You will not run away. You will not w walk away from me when I'm talking to you. No, you will not. And so the compelling now is that no matter where they turn, we bring it up. No matter what they do, you, we confront them with the, with the reality of our situation because they're going to play this cat and mouse game. And, 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 and I know sometimes people will say, well, you know, because um, I've had people even within the community say, well, you know, there's a time and place, right? And, the, and they use these very, um, I guess, from their perspective, they want to go about it because it's this play into respectability politics, which I'm not interested in doing, right? Because while I understand the need to be, I guess, um, 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 respectful and you want, you want to maintain the lines of communication, we cannot, we, I cannot um, have a civil conversation if you are intent on ensuring that my rights will, be, will not be acknowledged or my existence will not be acknowledged. 
And so in, in, in our efforts, the, this has to be a very militant stance towards whatever campaigns we decide. And I do think that as Dr. Sanders says, the issue sometimes is, is that we won't agree. But my whole thing is, I'm not willing to let the fact that we disagree come in between the fact that we have a common goal. Yeah. I'm not interested in that. So even if we can't agree on this, what can we agree on and move forward? Because what we can't agree on is that our, the quality of life that we're receiving in this particular space is not ideal for any of us. So no matter our differences, no matter if I disagree with Alexis's methods or her ideologies, no matter if I disagree with um, Dr. Sanders' ideologies or methods, I, we can agree on this fact that we're not being treated right in our own country. And that's, that, 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 that's the factor that binds me to the fact that no matter what, I'm committed to the cause. I mean, what you're talking about is trying to build alliances with other communities. I think it's easier, of course, LGBT, it'll be easier for us to work together. But others who are homophobic, mm -hmm. that is challenging. Hmm? Um, and there are, for example, if you have women's organizations that might be interested in these issues. Even but again, society. the majority of them are going to be what? Homophobic. So trying to break down those barriers so that we could even have a dialogue substantive dialogue okay. uh, and not just talk to a few people in there that are gay affirmative, hmm? mm -hmm. where they're going to in facilitate the building of alliance. So uh, we can't command people to uh, build, to have an alliance with us. We've got to try to facilitate that mm -hmm. and see where it goes. Okay. I mean, this is uh, the challenge that most uh, activists have is building alliances between groups. Okay. Many mm -hmm. of us overlap in a number of groups. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned about feminist issues. I'm concerned about LGBT issues. I'm, you know, I, there, there are a number of issues I'm concerned about, but uh, many of them are one issue centered and so it's very, and, and they have uh, resistances to you because you're LGBT or be, to you because you're a feminist. Not okay. because you're mm -hmm. just a woman, but you're a feminist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that I think becomes if I can... another issue. Uh, so it is challenging, but necessary work that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I saw someone talking about the abolition of policing. Yes, I was just going to get to that. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. And the question is, we have to look at our context. Okay. In places where this is feasible, we look at some of the Scandinavian countries where incarceration is basically almost, <laughs> some of them so very low, huh? very few people. We have one of the most, the highest incarcerations rates in the world. We have a serious functional illiteracy problem, which is driving uh, property crimes and criminality. And when you have that, the reflexive response is incarceration. <clears throat> to transform incarceration and policing needs to transform our society in a very fundamental way. Because the places in which this has been successful have been places that have strong we social welfare or socialistic formations. Mm -hmm. So ideally, absolutely, that should be a goal eventually, but I don't think that we can simply jump to that. Hmm? Yeah, I think we have to go through a process here. Uh, we can't even get uh, humane policing, let alone abolish. <laughs> mm -hmm. And with a crime rate that's very high, um, it's hard to imagine that we could find mass support from the public at large. Hmm? So, and I really do think the social context matters. 
Uh, mm -hmm. That's my view on that. Uh, but eventually, you want to create a society that's so humane that we don't think in terms of policing, we think in terms of educating, because most of those individuals who are in prison, we know, are functionally illiterate or illiterate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're not so well educated. Yeah. And then, of course, we have employment issues. Mm -hmm. When you have high unemployment, what are you going to have? Property crimes. Mm -hmm. And then the nature and, and the place where we have the most employment, right? In tourism and the nature of, of tourism, right? And we sell sex and sea and, and you know, we sell sex and and sea. Yeah. Not just sand and sea and sun, right? Uh -huh, we yeah. sell all of it. And so even, even with that, in in that space, right? It's mm -hmm. going to be difficult because these. But anyway, yeah. I just you know I just wanted to add that it's not just the the unemployment. It's that look at the space in which every, the majority of your people are employed and and how that space operates, right? Okay. And how they're forced to to interact. But it's really just drawing to the intersectionality of of of, of these things and what you said, um, well, Doctor Sanders. In terms of these multinational corporations here, um, policing serves their interests. Yes, exactly. Uh, exactly. So without question, their properties, um, the whole organizational style, protecting tourists from <laughs> perdition mm -hmm. uh, uh, is something that they have a vested interest in. Hmm? Yeah, I mean, if you're talking about these multinational corporations, but but not just mm -hmm. that, our our whole society is geared towards the preserving of those multinational corporations because we believe yeah, them. We're, to be we're, we're a dependent capitalist country. Without that's what we are. Yes, dependent right. capitalism, and um, and I don't see that changing in in, in the near future because of our size. We're very small. Think of how difficult it is, even for Cuba, which has gone the socialist path, uh, attempted the socialist path under difficult conditions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, very difficult. Um, and they are struggling, and they have struggled. When you, have, when you live under conditions of global capitalism, and you're a small, little, tiny, little dot, you're not in control. Right, and, and then it's now, a- It doesn't mean that you cannot make interventions that might be more of in the social welfare, building social welfare. That's the challenge is to try to build social welfare under these conditions, which we can do better. But to think that we can live outside of this existing system at this moment in history, I don't think so. Even the Eastern Bloc, which attempted to do it in the little corner of Europe, failed. They've all failed, and they failed for a reason. Even the Scandinavian countries, they capitulated uh, during the 90s, uh, late 90s, to liberal capitalism, uh, even though they had a culture of Develop culture of, of, of social welfare hmm? uh, uh, programs in education, mm -hmm. in healthcare, um, unemployment benefits, housing, and so on and so forth. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Yeah. One. Um, so, sorry, go ahead, Aaron. Sorry. Um, I was going to say, I um, I agree. I agree in with like Dr. Sanders. Boom, boom, boom. Right. I want to 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 engage the the, the question about defunding. You know, I think that the police force is is, is rooted in, in horrible ideology. It's poorly constructed, mm -hmm. and to some extent, it is underfunded, right? Um, and so, I think it's a it's it's less about defunding them and more about ensuring that the resources uh, go to the right place. Um, the second thing I wanted to say was, um, like Dr. Saunders said, like. Are we, are we going to be able to live outside of this reality in this time, right? Um, we live in a country of people who's police people, right? Like, the, the, so when people go into the force and they meet that culture, a lot of people, are they ready for that, right? Because 
we police people's bodies. And so outside of the community, inside of the community, you can't be too fat and thinking you're sexy. You know, you can't be too butch and thinking you're a woman. It, 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 the, the policing goes on and on and on. You can't, you can't come from this socioeconomic class and think you could hang out with us and, or know what your role is when you get here. Um, and, and, and the levels of policing and the way that we construct in our, our own spaces, we, we also have to, and to get into to those spaces and tackle that. And then I wanted to add, maybe as a part of a, a, a strategy, we also need a sensitization campaign for members of the community that are in a place to affect policy, right? Because what we know is that the two things, uh, we have queer people, if I can use that word, everywhere. They everywhere, right? I am, um, they in the House of Parliament, they sitting on the hills um, at policy levels, they're everywhere. Um, and some people are too frightened Right? They're frightened of the stigma of being of, of, of what comes with the visibility of, of having an agenda, even if the, the agenda aligns with your job description. Right? And then there's some people who are in those positions and they don't care, right, about the impact that or the, uh, the that how their presence impacts what's happening around them. And they certainly don't care to intervene, right? With what they know is in, in, um, is good policy. What they know is constitutionally um, sound, right? All citizens yeah. should have access but, but to this again, to this service. That's why we have to affirm coming out. I, you know, when I when I mm -hmm. talked about my presentation, thought about it. Pride is about coming out, and deep down inside. We don't have pride. Uh, we still internalize so much homophobia and transphobia, uh, uh, transgender phobia. Mm -hmm. We've internalized it so deeply that people feel such shame in, in, in coming out. In, uh, and, 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 and and we appear to have changed, but it's minimal. It or, really or having, is limited. Having their unless, visibility. Unless people uh, have courage. And we've got to find a way to empower people or encourage people to, to have that courage to come out. Because it's the only way that we're going to have radical transformation. Otherwise, it's still gonna be a dozen people working, trying to change things. And it's not going to change. Dr. Saunders, I wanna say, not just to come out, right, of the closet. Yes, no, to have a voice. But, but right, right, and to, and to not be afraid that their visibility in a particular space will ostracize them, right? One day I'm gonna That's tell you all the story. Out about how, one day I can tell you all the story about how a gay man, a gay man um, engaged in policy creation and, and presented a policy that would have been devastating, devastating to members of the LGBTI community, right? But I, I can mention this instance, I'm not gonna call the name because I also understand how, how visibility in that sense without the proper, um, without the proper space to ensure that they are also treated properly, right? Like even if I'm mad at you, that don't mean I won't beat you up or I wanna see harm come to you, right? And I, hopefully one day we have the space for that, but we have people in positions where they are out, you know, people know that they're queer, you know, but they don't want to spend the credit that they, or, or you know, that they have, have garnered or created on, on this issue, right? They, they're not gonna jeopardize their professional status or their social status to advance something that they know that they should be advancing. And not well, because, oh, they volunteered to be an advocate, but because it's the right thing to do. Well, let me be very clear. We have a culture here, and that's another paper. I couldn't do it all in one paper. 
That's um, all right. We can pay you. We can pay you. <laughs> uh, 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 I don't need to be paid. <laughs> um, my point is, we have a culture that is complex. On the one hand, you can be LGBT. You just got to be invisible. You've got to be straight identified LGBT. Hmm. See? Mm -hmm. That's that's the ticket. So when you talk about people who've been the architects, even the, the, the um, 1989 bill, some of the architects of that were who? LGBT. Mm -hmm. Let us think of clergy. How mm -hmm. many of them are LGBT? How many politicians? About straight identification and living a conventional lifestyle for the most part except for your private life you know uh-huh that mm -hmm. is the custom here it has complex layers and so we see these paradoxes where lgbt people are the architects of homophobic narratives which is a reflection of a deep level of internalized homophobia mm -hmm. and transgender homophobia uh, 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 deeply if, internalized heterosexism yes uh, natino if i could i want i just want to share something quickly go ahead that speaks, that speaks to sometimes the, the way that we also intentionally and unintentionally perpetuate these stereotypes, right? Or create an environment where some of these stereotypes pop up. And it has to do with a security guard, right? And a security company. So I was doing a little HIV session, giving out um, STI and HIV awareness and prevention kits, right? And I went to the club on Elizabeth Avenue and Bay Street, the pink one, with the stairs on the side, on the Bay Street side. And I was standing outside on the top of the stairs, giving out packages to people who were coming in and people who were leaving. And this, this young girl, this, and, and she just looked young. And she, she, it's just dripping off her, came out and asked me what I was doing. And, and, and I told her, and she said, well, give me one. And I told her, I can't give you one. She said, why? I said, because you look like you under 18. And I am not allowed by law to distribute or provide any type of um, sexual health medical service, particularly to LGBTI people, right, that are under the age to, under the age of eighteen. And this young girl told me, "Well, I, you're right. I'm fifteen. Why can't I be in the club?" And so I looked at the security officer, and I look at her, and I look back at the security officer. So I say, "Well, you are under the age of eighteen. That's why you can't be in the club." And will and then just, will give me a package, and I had to explain to her. I cannot give you this package in front of the security officer because his job then is to say, Miss Green, what the hell are you doing? You know what the law is, right? And so the fortunately, the security officer turned and looked at her and said, yeah, she can. She ain't supposed to give you that. Anyway, the girl went back in the club. And she told me, that's my friend club, right? And it's not that I don't think that her friend, you know, who may own or bartend or whatever was not aware of her and taking care of her, right? Like, a, and, and ensuring her safety. It's just that here's now is that security officer that's standing there on his job, right? And he could go back to anybody and say, man, look here, there's let these little children inside the club, you know. There's let these little 15 year olds inside the club. But also for him, his job, right, is supposed, he's supposed to go to the owner or the manager on duty and say, boss, you guys figure out how this young lady getting home tonight, right now, because she's not supposed to be here and I'm not supposed to be letting it happen, right? I, so I just wanted to, like you talk about the complexities. Here we have this space where the security guard, the boy is LGBTI sensitive or friendly because he's willing to work the club. People knew him. He, he, was, he seemed to be generally polite and amicable, right? And he, it didn't seem like he wanted to sour their vibe. Um, by reporting that there's a minor in the club acting like she work here or she owned the club. But then at the same time, we want to rely on them to protect us if something breaks out, right? 
that guy, that security officer may be very conflicted in his head. Like, well, I just can let y'all do whatever y'all want to do. I ain't getting in it. Um, and, 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 and so even within the structures in our own community, we need to figure out how we're going to police ourselves, right? A 15-year-old is, be, is a sexual being. A 15-year-old can be, and we know many who are aware of their sexuality, right? A 15-year-old needs a space to be able to be safe, to feel comfortable, to feel community, right? But a 15-year-old should not be in a gay club on a Saturday or a Sunday night. Just should not. And I know that because I could tell you all, I was 13 and 14 in Waterloo, and I shouldn't have been there. And thank God I met a man that had, had some sense and decency and critical thinking, because as soon as he realized how old I was, he bought me a ginger ale and made me show him how I was getting home that night, right? Who the people I riding with, like he just, he just went into super adult parent mode. So 15 year olds shouldn't be in that space. How are we going to police our community and how are we going to structure it, right? To ensure that young people have a safe space to be in where they can explore and experience themselves as full beings including their sexuality without the danger of predators but also without endangering the safe spaces that we have are, are trying to build for ourselves and without endangering the social contract right because what we're saying to people is look we citizens we agree everything you agree with. Nobody should live a, a life free of violence. Children should be safe and protected. People should have the right to work, right? Like this is a social contract. We ain't, we, we trying to be a part of society or we trying to safely be a part of the society we are already a part of. How do we construct our spaces and police our spaces to ensure that people are safe and that the most vulnerable in the community are also safe too? But, and, and for instance, looking ahead. at in, in the entertainment space, looking at trans people, right? We don't need um, gay men or gay women inviting their straight friends to the club to be laughing at trans people or creating, a, you know, a, a more dangerous environment for trans people. Mm -hmm. You know, so even within our own communities, how are we going to operate and structure ourselves, right? And, and I'd say policing, but how are we going to structure ourselves to create safe space for us as well? Um, I, I wanted to touch on, on, on a few things because you talk about the social contract, right? Mm -hmm. I think um, th th when you bring up that fact, right? And then you look, personally, I don't, I don't subscribe to, a gr to the assumption that as I, come, I, as I came out of the womb and because I was born to these two particular parents that I have, that I automatically agree to the, the rules of the society, right? I, and I think that when you are looking at LGBTQ people in the Bahamas in particular, um, and even around the world, if we're, at, if we're on the periphery and, 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 and the dominant cultures in the center, technically, even if you agree to that social, like it makes no sense for you to agree to a social contract of, of which you're being excluded from. Right, but no, that's not, the, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that they they try to exclude us, but they see they cannot exclude us, right? They 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 want us to think, okay, they want us to feel like we are on the fringes and we are excluded and we are forcing our way into spaces that we don't belong in. But the truth is, this our space just as much as it's anybody else's space. And so the social contracts I'm talking about, yeah, because I, I appreciate what you're saying. These are these basic things like children are full beings and they have they they have they are full beings including their sexuality uh -huh. just because they express sexuality doesn't mean that i as an adult have the right to engage them and try have sex with them or have a sexually intimate relationship with them right uh -huh. like that's one of the the, the the supposed to be the overarching you know that the social contract children are children and no matter what they do and no matter how sassy or whatever they be in that, that that in no way warrants an adult engaging them sexually right the, the social contract was everybody everybody needs to eat everybody deserves access to health care those those are the things that i'm talking about yeah, Not no, the, uh, yeah yeah let me ask 
do you think that that is sorry hi William me I try not to input too much all the time but do you think that that's something that is exclusively happening in our community because I don't think it is well, I no, think it that's, is that's right. the point it, that it is something that is happening full stop and I think it it is due to the fact that in our age bracket we would have come up with you know okay we're going to sneak into the club and you know we would do that under the guise of going with older persons mm -hmm. however this generation now has grown up looking and acting like they are age mm -hmm. their bodies are not structured like that of a 13 year old anymore they look like grown women and grown men so the problem when you're looking at the policing aspect of it is the kids being honest and the children are not being honest yeah they are lying straight up to the adult and they're misleading the adults in some situations i'm not saying that the adults are 100% you know unknowing but i know of cases where the adults just did not know Yeah. And at the end of the day, they're in problems with the police and the, the children don't understand why it's a problem, why they, they need to be honest. Will, William, I, I, I hear you. I, I, I agree. I, I, I hear what you're saying. I had, an, I had a situation. I met this woman at a little gay event and we danced and we had a good time, right? And mm -hmm. I didn't get a number or anything, but we had a really good time. And then I met her. Well, I went to the little hole in the wall on Market Street a month later and I was sitting next to this, this young woman, right? And I was talking to somebody and eventually she's like, hey, hey, you know, and she's like, you don't remember me, hey? And I'm looking at this young girl, right? And I said, no, I don't remember you. And she said, man, you dance with me at the club on, Bay, on, on East Bay Street and you don't remember me? I said, no, girl, I dance with a big woman. I oh, dance yeah. with a big woman at that club. I dance with you. And that young lady was hot with me. She's mad because I explained to her, if I had known how old you were in that on that scene, I wouldn't have danced with you. And now that I know how old you are, the only thing I can tell you is, how are you getting home and do you want a ginger ale? Pretty and much. I stopped, I, listen, a part of me and my advocacy, I stopped drinking to make sure that I don't get in situations like that because see, William, what I want to say is this, the social contract I'm talking about is this. When you're an adult, you don't assume what somebody's age is. You find that shit out before you engage in intimacy. And that's, right, and, and, and that's a degree of maturity that we have to help people in our community get to. Because forget LGBTI, that's what it means to be an adult, and I agree with you, it ain't just happening in the LGBTI community. The example I gave you, that was Waterloo. That I was Waterloo that when I was 13. And I put but, my hand, look here. I, I accidentally put my hand on this man's penis. And when he saw the look on my face, that's when he said to me, how old are you? <laughs> and when I told him, he was like, uh-uh, uh-uh, he wanted to get hand sanitizer. He wanted to cleanse himself with the holy water. He was ahead but, of the corona, but... Aaron, I, I could tell you I have realized, right? I don't bother to go much anymore, and that's just the nature of me now. But with the, the newer promoters and party planners that are in the market now, the security is informed to catch you at the door. So it's not a, even a, oh, I'm coming in because, you know, I'm coming in, I'll use Natino as an example, with Natino, and everybody knows Natino, and we all know, no. Everyone has to show ID, you know, and the only exception I've seen to that is if the promoter comes to the door and says, no, 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 it's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, I know that person is far above the age because they older than me, but the securities, they're, they're taking their jobs a little bit more serious. Well, in our community cases anyway, and speaking about, you know, wider community events that I would go to, a lot of them were the same way. They're going to cart you. They're carting now and they're taking that a lot more seriously because of the problems that have been happening with the minors. So I think a lot of it is going to come down to 
re-education of the adults and understanding they have to do adult things because there are penalties. The kids have to understand why it's a problem and what you can actually do to someone's life. So that's an education that needs to come into the school system. You know, why you cannot play and lie as an adult. But then again, that is the parents needing to now also take responsibility. It cannot always be not my good child because your child is the one in this situation too. Your child is the 16 year old running away to be with a grown man. Your child was not kidnapped. Your child left the house. You have to take responsibility for this as well. Although it, the 16 is the age of consent, but you understand the, the point here that I'm trying to illustrate. But it has I, to be I, community responsibility on all, all angles when I, it comes to protecting our Bahamian youth. I think when we, uh, get, yeah, when we get to right. that, uh, let, me, uh, um, let me just make this one point um, and then I'll let you go, Dr. Sanders, because we're getting ready to wrap up right now for our next session, right? But I think I, I, the reason why I was challenging Aaron's statement was simply because at this particular point in time, we still have discrimination in the age of consent, which makes it very difficult for us then to say, oh, well, you, you, you're going to police um, 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 the LGBTQ community in this way because we're still being discriminated against because I can have heterosexual sex at 16 in the Bahamas, right? So technically, and, and um, like she was one year away. And I know, watch this, I went to school with 15 year olds and 14 year olds who were dating 19 year olds. And when you told them, do you know that that statutory rape, you know, they say, that's my boyfriend and that, this is my body. What, can you, what are you gonna do about it? So conversations around the discrimination itself within um, the, um, the age of consent and then I, I think we have to talk about the agency of, 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 the person in, of, of the person in question. Because if I know, watch this, um, the, the research bears out that, 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 that women in particular, young girls, they, they, they are advanced more quickly in, in terms of their body and they know what they want um, um, quickly um, 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 in terms of age. And where does, like, so that this idea of a child, which is a social construct, right? But it's something that's been around, I think, for the last hundred years. Um, um, like, we have to interrogate the agency of children themselves. Because there were certain things at my age that I knew, and I, I, I did not care. N not that they were sexual, but I'm talking about I knew about myself. And no matter how much my parents said that this is what they wanted me to do, it wasn't happening. And so the agency, the, um, the agency of the child in question, or the teenager, um, 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 if they're under the age of consent. Um, I think that, that that's a good place to interrogate what you're talking about, the social contract. And that was just my point, Dr. Sanders. Uh, uh, yeah, I wanted to speak to that because, you know, I've been writing even when I wrote earlier on this very question. Uh, you must understand that even in our context, the age of consent was 14. The age of consent has grown, has gone up. They changed the age of consent. So we have generations where the age of consent was 14 because that was the school leaving age. It was pragmatic. Uh, you have all over the world, you have different ages of consent. Hmm? You have places where the age of consent is 14. Uh, a lot of the Scandinavian countries is 14. You have other places where it's 18. Uh, the whole question of maturity, if we look at it cross-culturally over centuries, when you hit adolescence, when your body reached a certain level of maturity, you were considered an adult, and that was usually in your teenage years, early teens. You know, your 13, 14 year old, you were considered an adult. So uh, absolutely, it is a construct. Uh, the complexity of today's world is we live in a world uh, where, we, on the one hand, we're sexualized beings, all of us, and when we reach a certain age, we become more interested in sexuality and uh, uh, relating to others. Um, and so uh, I think when you're talking about early teens, uh, you, you're talking about a gray area. Uh, you have some young adolescent, 
young people that are quite capable of engaging in responsible sexual activity at say 14. Uh, and there are others who might be, uh, there are some adults who are capable of <laughs> engaging in responsible sexual activity. Um, so, uh, so when we talk about the distinction between a child and an adult, um, there's a process here. There is this tendency within our culture when it comes to sexuality to infantilize young people. In fact, to disavow their sexuality and the fact that they are being sexual. Uh, a lot of young people, teenagers between 13 and uh, 18, they're quite sexually active in, during that period of time. Now, should they be? Uh, the question is, how do we prepare young people to be responsible sexual beings? And we haven't done a very good job at that. Uh, as a culture, um, and being very rigid about age of consent has its, can be problematic. Um, but again, the law is intended to provide some protection on both sides. Uh, uh, so, but I'm just trying to uh, uh, articulate how complex this is. And I agree that we can't take uh, the norms, the existing norms of age of consent as, as um, being absolutely uh, rational in terms of, of, of uh, as a parameter of maturity, of sexual maturity, it's not. Um, and these questions are very, very difficult to bring up in Bahamian society because there are a lot of strong emotions on various sides around this issue. One, protecting of children and on the, uh, 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 of children. And then of course we have this old history of sexual activity as teenagers from the earlier uh, pre-1991 uh, age of consent, which was 14. So I just wanted to, to throw that out there. Definitely. Um, thank you, I, thank you. Definitely, definitely. As we get ready to wind down, right? Um, what, I just wanted to reiterate what, we, what Aaron had suggested and what Dr. Saunders had talked about and what Alexis um, um, definitely gave us. Um, we talked about um, the creation or the implementation of sensitivity training within the police force. And we also talked about that that's a measure that we want to see happening as a measure to combat the homophobia within police force. We talked about the creation of a LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus unit that would actually deal with the cases as they came up, right? Because I, I want us to make sure that we're walking away from this particular panel with what we discuss. Um, we also talked about engaging the regional um, um, advocacy or regional organizations, which the police force is a part of. I can't remember the organization um, um, name that Aaron mentioned, um, as a way to, um, to get them to understand that this is what other officers or other um, organizations, police organizations are doing, and to help them understand that that would be the, the progressive way to go. Um, we also talked about engaging the assistant commissioner, I'm sorry, the commissioner of police, the now commissioner of police, um, Paul Rule. We talked about engaging former commissioner of police, um, like um, um, Ellison Green said, um, um, and seeing how he would be able to help us in that kind of function. Um, and we also talked about, um, I, I think that that's, we talked about the kind of strategy that we're looking at, but I think overall, we well, so the one thing is missing is okay. that we want LGBT civic community yes. to be uh, to mediate. We, yes. We, yeah. Yes. Yes. We need, we need to to be a part of that process. So mm -hmm. yeah. So LG, the LGBTQ communities and uh, um, um, uh, sorry, the organizations within the communities, we need to act as liaisons or mediators um, yes. to help facilitate 
this kind of um, um, change that we want to see. Yes, the social transformation that you keep talking about, Dr. Sanders. And so these are the things that we want to talk about. So um, as we walk away and as we get ready to prepare for the next, um, uh, I guess, the, the, next pan, um, the, the next presentation, I should say, um, I'll, I'll, I'll allow anyone to have some final comments, um, final comments, final um, questions, um, and then we'll end. Um, does anybody have any final comments? Aaron, you want to take it? Um, yeah, Aaron has something to say. Go ahead, Aaron. Um, just to close out, you know, I want to say um, some of the things I shared today, I hope people got a sense of, you know, why my advocacy strategies have, you know, why I've taken on the strategies that I've taken on. Um, I am very privileged, right? I have a place to live. I'm unemployed, but I have economic support. And, uh, but I, and I feel a degree of safety in my country, right? Feel a degree of safety in my community. But I do not, um, I, I do not feel safe and free and liberated, uh, particularly after that stalking matter, particularly after the way I was engaged during my campaign around the referendum. And I would say this to people, you know, like, so I understand the levels of distrust with the police. Um, I tell people, in fact, I tell the police, right? Whenever I have an incident on the road, I tell the police, I pull my cutlass on somebody. And in fact, I had this situation where I was coming home from NAGB one night um, after Women's Wednesdays and coming across Green Parrot and the Defense Force um, unit there. This car pulled out of the Defense Force unit um, and I blew my horn because they looked like they were coming straight into me. And the car slowed down and the man in the car said to me, the defense force trained me to kill bitches like you, right? And I think that boy knew who I was. He slowed down, it took him a moment. He knew who I was when he said that. And I pulled my cutlass from, my, from the side of me on my car because I saw a police car coming from behind me. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I waited for the police car to catch up. And the boy, he waited too. And he kept telling me that. He repeated that over and over again to me until the police car got very close and he drove off. And I told the police what happened and the police went and they stopped him. This boy was a defense force officer, right? And so I travel with my cutlass. And whenever I have an incident that, that make me feel like I have to pull my cutlass, I call the police and I tell them, I pull my cutlass on somebody and this is why. And if, if they give me attitude about it, right, I just remind them that, A, I am calling you to tell you what I did. And B, if you guys would, you know, working a little harder, I wouldn't have to pull my cutlass. All right. Um, I wanted to, when you mentioned that, um, Alexis, could you tell us of the is it a shared incident report database? Could you tell us about that? So that we know, see, and this is the part of the mediating, Sorry? Dr. Sanders. Yeah. Um, um, this is a part of the mediating. So that, um, and I think that what I'm, what we want to try to do at the organization is that we also want to, if you, if you don't feel safe reporting an incident to the police, um, come to the um, to the Facebook page of Bahamas organization of, of, of LGBTI affairs. Send us, get, even if you have to just give it to us in um, in, in audio format. It does not matter. We need to document these incidents because it because even if they won't, even if you don't feel safe going there, we need to we need to have it on record so that we can say that this did happen on X Y date. We need that. But go ahead, Alexis, and tell us about the shared incident data um, the, um, the, um, the database. Okay, so we do have a um, method in place for our community to report violence, um, human rights abuses. It's called SID, which is the Shared Incident Database. We've been approved through CDC, which is the Caribbean Vulnerable Community um, Coalition. In being an official document taker for incidents of violence against our um, LGBTI community, and it's also been extended to vulnerable communities such as migrant communities for them to report incidents of violence against their community. So if you have any type of um, incidents of violence, harassment, and another thing about it is some of our community members don't even know what violence looks like. 
They don't even understand verbal violence is violence. Trauma violence is violence. So what we have done is we have um, team up process to have this, this um, database in order to be able to report and have documentation of things that are going unreported in our community. So for example, if you're in a domestic dispute or same sex relationship and you have a problem reporting to the police, you can tell us, we will intervene and then we will go with you to the police station. These are some of the steps we have and report the violence, but we will keep our own documentation of what has happened to you. We're gonna start recording exactly acts of violence towards our vulnerable communities. And it's just not the LGBTI. We're rolling this across the board to different vulnerable communities. Yeah. So this database is going to be coming on board. It's already on board through our trans organizations and now through the Bahamas um, Organization of LGBTI Affairs, which will be responsible for capturing data of incidents of human rights violations and also violence against our vulnerable community. All right. So you again, you have the information. These are some of these are just some of the suggestions um, that we were able to come up with. This was a great talk. Um, up next, we have uh, LGBTQ plus and migration, the intersectionality of those two um, um, areas um, in the Bahamas, and that's going to be um, by done by Stephanie's um, Saint. Flora, I think that's the last name, yes. And she's from the Rights Bahamas organization. Um, you have the link in um, your emails and it will also be posted um, on Facebook for those individuals who um, um, have access to that page. Um, this was, I wanna thank everyone who was able to just kind of frame the conversation. I wanna thank you, Dr. Sanders. I wanna thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Alexis. And thank you all for coming out because again, this is just the first step. Um, next year, um, we're gonna. I, what I'm gonna try to do is I'm gonna use all of the techniques. We're gonna use these. We're gonna employ these, um, and we're gonna call on all of the people um, to help us employ this. And we're gonna get this done. And we're gonna see if anything has changed, so that when when the time comes, they cannot say that we didn't do our part to actually make the social transformation because we are committed to this cause. Um, so once again, thank you everyone for tuning in. And our next session starts at three, so you have about a 12 minute break. Um, and then you can um, click the link in your email and then you'll have the presentation by Stephanie St. Fleur. So thank you again, once again. And, and thank you, William. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you for your contribution, William. Thank I'm glad you, you called my name. Natino, I have a shameless plug. Everyone, okay. uh, the videos are on YouTube, uh, all except this one so far. So if you missed any or you want to catch up or you want to share with friends, family or the internet, Check it out on YouTube, share it, and let's really start to push it out. Yes. Yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. I want to get all the links um, so that my students and faculty members can have access to it and learn. Yeah, I so, will send you a link to the, the YouTube page, Dr. Sanders. Yeah, thank you. But, you know, just before we go, I want to uh, just quickly share two things. Okay. Um, I think we should also consider how UB can be a part of our strategizing, right? Particularly because of the UB Charter and okay. how they've positioned themselves. And then I just wanted to share very quickly some interesting and amusing things that police officers have shared with me privately, right? Mm -hmm. um, in, in some of these instances. And when I was being stalked, you know, one police officer, he saw me somewhere, I think after seeing the story in the paper, and he told me I must need a bullhorn, right? I need one of those uh, can ho um, canned horns. And he's like, look here, the next time that sucker call you, blow his eardrum out, right? And then I've had police officers who have said to me, like off duty, um, informally, you have a cutlass, travel with it, right? Like they have, they have said, I can't tell you this officially, but protect yourself, do whatever it takes. And so I say to my community, protect, protect yourself. yourself. Uh -huh. Definitely, um, protect yourself. Um, because at this present time, we're not like we, we're not sure if we will be able to be protected. So I, I definitely agree with that. Um, don't commit any crimes, but definitely protect yourself. Um, and with that, we'll sign off. See you at the next session. Good evening. Okay.